time reading works by people like David McCullough, you know, people who write more for the general public. And I aspired to be more like that, but there's no manual. I just tried to work it out year after year with some books doing better than others. Many, many, I couldn't get the academic thing out of my, my system. But this particular topic came along and really it lifted me up. I mean, sometimes the topic lifts you up rather than the other way around. And from the moment I began to work on Lincoln on this train trip, there was something exciting and uh, immersive and very visual about it. I felt like, I mean, what you said, I felt like I was there sitting next to him on the train minute after minute. It's hard for me to explain why I always had that feeling, but I, I did. Um, Lincoln, as we all know, is the greatest protagonist you can have for a history book, but then also having him moving on this train and looking at, uh, at these very different cities that he's going through gave it a kind of um, visual intensity that I, I felt I was looking out the windows of the train with Lincoln at America. All, uh, well, that's at, exactly it, Ted, it's yeah. true. It's, it, and that's what you found too, and we're gonna get into that too. I want to ask you, though, you're coming out of this, into this, not as a Lincoln man for all your life, even though you may have known and read about him, but you didn't come from the pantheon of Lincoln academics uh, in the circle, which is, I think, pretty good. You're, you're in the area of Lord Charnwood from 1916 from right. England, right. and from Richard Carwardine, also from England. Sidney Blumenthal more recently, who are coming in with different views uh, and bring a fresh perspective. Um, now, of course, that's, that's to me the good part. There are also some times where we in the Lincoln world might disagree with an interpretation or two. One minor one I'm gonna say right now is that when you, when you went to the um, uh, Lincoln home, just as he, as he was nominated, saying that the upholstery maybe needed a little bit, it needed reupholstering the couches, et cetera. And to me, that was a very proper middle-class home. And I don't think Mary would have allowed that. Lincoln may have needed reupholstering, but I accept, nonetheless- I accept um, your point. So what is it like to approach Lincoln from the outside? It's intimidating. I mean, as you know very well, there are those 15,000 books that have been written and it's hard to find a way in. And I hesitated before committing to do this book. It, it began for me, you, you may remember the New York Times ran a, an online series of essays about the Civil War for five years during the 150th called Disunion. And I started writing quick pieces in that series, but they, they, they may have been quick in a sense. They ran day after day, but I wanted to honor Lincoln with serious research. So I, I was reading heavily during the day, and I was lucky at that time to be based at Brown University, which has a very good Lincoln library. The John Hay. Yeah, yeah, really first, first rate. Um, and I was trying to say something new no one wants to repeat what has been said earlier. And as I got more deeply into this train journey, I really thought, well, there's some room to say something here. And my first thought was I would take a couple years and write a book of about 200 pages about these th only 13 days. It's not very long of a period. But then as I dropped down more deeply into it, I realized it was a really big story. It's, um, it's a big story. In Lincoln's life, you've got his evolution as a speaker. He's, he's really improving a lot over a short time. And by the end of this, the, the trip, he's giving some astonishing speeches. Well, he begins this, the trip with an astonishing speech too, the farewell address. Well, but he didn't then, like off the cuff speaking, really. He liked having, having it written down ahead and thinking about right. it through and not off the cuff, but really through this trip, as you're saying, he learned how to do a bit of that, even though he didn't do as much later on. He didn't like it, but he was good at it, and he got even better at it. And the pressures of it all drew something deep out of him. And so I got very excited about the, the speech in Philadelphia Independence Hall 
on Washington's birthday and what a beautiful speech it is and talks very evocatively about what the Declaration of Independence has always meant to him. And I think yeah. he's, he's not only giving a good speech in that room, he's welcoming all of these Americans who have very different political viewpoints, but he's welcoming them into his camp. He's saying, we're all the heirs of the American Revolution and of this great document. And it was a brilliant use of Washington's birthday as a, as a patriotic holiday on a day when Jefferson Davis, who has been inaugurated, didn't do anything especially interesting for Washington's birthday. So, and I, I felt like by the time the trip was ended, he's not that far from being able to give the Gettysburg Address, even though it's two years away. Well, the Independence Hall chapter is, is a compelling chapter. Uh, of course, they plan to be there on the birthday and give a talk. But that building, still, if you ever go and go to it, it encompasses a myriad of purposes throughout its history. Right. In a way, it represented the nation's meeting place, just as the Lincoln Memorial does today. Absolutely. And as you write, it represented the contradictions of the American people. It brought us together, though, in those days separately. But Lincoln restored its integrity, you say, and bringing us back together to our democratic roots as the Lincoln Memorial beckons us today. Fascinating. That's a great comparison. I hadn't even thought to make it, but in Lincoln's day, Independence Hall was a lot like what the Lincoln Memorial is today, that everyone felt a kind of emotional connection that if they if they wanted to think about America's roots as a country, or even if they wanted to argue against someone different, they would go there. And so when Lincoln goes, he, he's going there for a, a reason. It's not just that he has to go through Philadelphia on his way to Washington, but he wants to kind of recalibrate where America comes from and where it's going. And I, I, in some of my research, I found I was, I was shocked to discover that it had been a, a jail for fugitive slaves in the 1850s. So it had really come a pretty long way from the place where the Declaration of Independence was signed. And Lincoln knew all that, of course. And by going through there, he kind of retakes possession of it. Yeah, yeah. Now these, as I say, are snapshots of America, just like Trollope did when, when coming right. through America. Exactly. Uh, you get, you encounter all sorts of America as you're going through this. I don't think Lincoln knew that would happen. Uh, but let me ask you about this, because this immediately got to me, and it's a theme throughout, the Greeks and the Romans. There are numerous allusions to classical Greece in your book. Uh, where did you first encounter these connective chords, and how do they affect you, and how do they illuminate your book? I was terrified of my own inclination to do that. I, I will be honest because Lincoln is plenty big enough topic for anybody. And I thought, am I going to ruin this book by putting in references to the, the Greeks? But it kept coming back to me. One, one is simply that a lot of the visuals of America were Greek revival buildings. Most of the state houses he goes to are, are Greek revival. Washington is filled with Greek revival uh, building Springfield, Illinois. I mean, it's just the way America looked. But also, democracy originates in ancient Greece, 5th century BC. And there's a subplot to the book that is, if Lincoln doesn't survive his train trip, democracy may not survive either. So it's a story that is actually thousands of years old about people trying to govern themselves better and not needing kings and emperors. And so it gave it something a little bit bigger than American history, which appealed to me. But then also the more I thought about it, and I ended up, my, my plan to write the book in two years went out the window and it took me nine years until, you know, it took a long time. But <laughs> Welcome to Lincoln. Yeah, exactly. Um, there is an, a feeling that this is a, a an epic kind of a quest in the best sense. I mean, and Lincoln liked books like this in his youth. He liked John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. He probably read Don Quixote and, and he did read Homer's Odyssey. And 
there's a feeling of an individual, a heroic figure, struggling against epic forces. He has extraordinary talents, but he also has, has to face extraordinary adversity. And it felt often like Homer's Odyssey to, to me, if that doesn't sound too pretentious, but there are even specific parallels. Lincoln put on a kind of different costume. He, he didn't go in the famous Scottish tunic and, and hat, but he changed his appearance. And at the end of the Odyssey, the hero Odysseus goes in a disguise into his own home to deceive the, the people who are called the suitors, who are living off of his wife. Yeah, exactly. There it is. Yeah, that's, that's, um, well, we exactly. will get to that. So um, I kept feeling there are parallels. And in the Odyssey, you also feel like he's saving his people. It's not only he's saving his family, but he's saving his people. And I felt the same way about Lincoln. If he, if he makes it there and he survives, he will save America and the experiment in democracy. Now, before we get to the train trip itself and some of the innumerable stories and anecdotes and observations that go along those short 13 days, as you say, a lot packed in. Let me get to a couple of larger themes again. Now you start out with, uh, literally start out with Albert Richardson, meeting him on the Lincoln on the way going to Kansas. Right. And to Troy, Kansas. And Richardson, I'm just going to read a couple of sentences, was there and saw Lincoln giving a talk. And he said, he thought first, if Illinoisans consider this a great man, their ideas must be very peculiar. But in 10 or 15 minutes, I was unconsciously and irresistibly drawn by the clearness and closeness of his argument. Give him his premises and his conclusions were as inevitable as death. So I love that you starting out with Richardson because he really saw him gives this. So you have some other uh, ideas about Lincoln. You call him bipolar. And you say that mental health is critical to the book. Now, my father was a psychoanalyst. And uh, the phrase that caught my attention was mental health was the key to this story. So please explain yourself in the bipolarism briefly. Well. I do agree with that point. I, I slightly regret using the adjective bipolar because that is a, a specific clinical condition. And what I meant was more that he is moody. He has up moments and, and down moments, which many, many witnesses um, described. And, and Josh Shank's book, Lincoln's Melancholy, goes into in great detail. But but Herndon is, is really strong on this point, and Hern, Herndon's informants are, are also uh, you know, clear that there was a sadness inside Lincoln that, that actually increases his fascination to all of us, that he, yes. he had to conquer this melancholy inside of him. And we still don't know exactly the source. It may have been the death of his mother or his sister or Anne Rutledge or just some sense of um, the difficulty of life. Who, who knows exactly, but... Um, yeah, I think it was a part of him. This is not having him on the couch, but right. uh, I think there was a, a part of him and moodiness, and I can not, now understand what you were saying, because uh, I was a little bit confused as to what that meant. Well, you also call him a natural leveler. Yeah. Well, oh, and then also in mental health, it's a a mental health advocate, Dorothea Dix, who picks up the first intelligence that there's a very advanced plot to kill him as he comes through Baltimore on his way to Washington. So this occasional sufferer from mental illness, Abraham Lincoln, although he's, he has conquered it, he, he, but he suffered in his youth from it. Um, but this sufferer from mental illness is in a sense saved by a pioneering worker in mental health, Dorothea Dix, who in traveling through the South, hears that there's this big plot to, to kill him. So that, that also was why I felt it was a mental health story. And I, I felt like Lincoln's calm was restoring mental health to a country that was in danger of being overheated, and North and South. And he had a way of 
calming everything down. And I think that came from his own battles to calm himself down. So that, uh -huh. but um, as far as the That's leveler, the leveler, I, I noticed in, I mean, I, I read a ton and I really love Herndon's biography and then also the, the, the book Herndon's Informants that came out from the um, Lincoln Studies Center at Knox College. What a wealth of anecdotal material is in that incredible book. Yeah, and Douglas and Davis did a beautiful job with that. And it's necessary if you're gonna have Herndon, Herndon's own work, you have to have that right next to yes, it. Yes, I absolutely love that, that work. Um, now, you had others, of course, that you looked at. Uh, I'm gonna give, uh, first of all, a sum up of what you know, set the stage of what this was. I happen to have a copy of, of Pinkerton's book, History and Evidence of the Passage of Abraham Lincoln from Harrisburg to Washington. We'll get to that a little bit later on, but let's start at the beginning. And what it was overall, here is that book. Um, I'll give you That's some great. of the metrics. It was 12 days, 1,092 miles traveled, 18 railroad lines eight states, over a hundred speeches. So briefly, tell us the overall view of it that you have, very briefly, because we're gonna get into the weeds here, and how your sources helped you, especially Henry Adams, Henry Villard, John Nicolay, all of those seem to be major sources for you. They are. I, I To be honest, I relied much more on contemporary sources than on historians of the last 50 or 100 years, I, I really wanted original eyewitness accounts. And so um, Villard is fascinating. Villard is you know interesting guy in his own right, later is a railroad tycoon, but he's a German immigrant and a very talented journalist. He's just a guy who wears a lot of hats and, and he sees Lincoln on his way to Troy, Kansas in that opening um, section that you mentioned with Albert Richardson. And also I liked, you know, the, the Odyssey begins in Troy and I like that this book begins in Troy, Kansas. Um, Henry Adams is a young man, but a very good writer, a very good eyewitness to the, the unhappy scene in Washington where it feels like the United States of America is grinding to a halt basically. So I wanted to establish how grim Washington was before Lincoln gets on the train to try to get there. And so Henry Adams is a really good eyewitness to people pushing each other on the sidewalk. And I mean, it's not so different from, from how it feels now in, in some ways. And then Hay and Nicolay are always great. Um, Hay is an unbelievable writer to the end of his life. Nicolay is no slouch either. And so I, I relied heavily on both their published writings and, and I got into Nicolay's uh, unpublished writings in, in the, his collection in the Library of Congress, but a very, very major source for me was local newspapers. So I was yeah. lucky that in the last 10 years, just as I was doing this book, a lot of them were digitized. Uh, and specifically, there's a site called Chronicling America that was right. ho hosted by the Library of Congress and the National Endowment for the Humanities. And just, you know, thousands of pages of 19th century newspapers are readable through Chronicling America. So I could go every 10 miles in Illinois or Indiana and Ohio and pluck a little obscure newspaper out from the map and then see if they wrote anything about Lincoln coming through. And this was a huge news story. So just about everyone did. So I, I just found tons of great contemporary observations. Do you think that Lincoln, um, well, you describe it as a general a chance to unite Americans and that Lincoln was in a way doing that as he went along from America to America to America to America, in this little place, that little place, as the newspapers will tell you as you can do that. Every historian I know today is saying, thank God for newspapers. It's opened up a yeah. whole new world for all of yeah. us. But so did he accomplish that objective, at least in the North? I believe so. I mean, it's, it's important for us to remember what a, what a weak, president-elect he was. So he, he really won because it was a four-person race and the Democratic Party split in half. 
and he has under 40% of the vote. He has 39.8%. I mean, he has a healthier margin in the Electoral College, but still, he's got the second worst uh, margin of victory after John Quincy Adams of any president, which is amazing when you think of Lincoln's stature, almost universally agreed as the greatest president in American history, but the second worst mandate coming in. And he's got lots of Northerners who voted for Douglas um, or just queasy about him. The Republican Party is hardly unified. You've got way more abolitionist feeling in New England and upstate New York than in Pennsylvania, for example, or Indiana. It's, you know, it's really like a hastily thrown together composite of former Whigs, former Democrats, and, and a few know-nothings. And so he's got to unite this um, state by state. He's got to go through and try to consolidate all of these elements. And I think the train trip worked quite well for that. And so he had to go to a state capital time after time. He starts in Springfield, he goes to Indianapolis, he hits Columbus, Albany, um, Harrisburg, uh, Trenton before that. And in each place, he's sort of consolidating these, these disparate elements, not only of the Republican Party, but of the state itself. And state by state, it's like he's rebuilding the union. Well, you know, I would say that, that Lincoln was very well equipped to do that. It was some of your best passages that got me were when he was along the Ohio River. And you point out that he was on the very line between slave and That's free right. states. He could look over to the slave states. He traveled, you say, through a bitterly contested borderland with passions running high. But I think he was uniquely equipped to to go between all of these different political currents because he grew up in border states. Kentucky, I agree. Southern Indiana, Central Illinois. Right. That's border state. So he, was, he knew all of these different political the, uh, parties and affiliations and could deal with them on the trip. I totally agree with you. That, that's a, a big reason why he snuck in there and got the nomination from Seward was he could win the more moderate states like Pennsylvania and, and Indiana, but then it was a huge bonus that I, I don't think anyone even fully understood when he was nominated, which was that he could really talk the language of those border regions. And I mean, he had a lifetime of experience. He was he, a flatboat pilot on the Ohio. And we, I, I, yeah, I, I really studied geography in this book and, and, if I took a long time, part of it was I just poured over maps forever, looking at every spot that he was going through. And we talk a lot about the Mason-Dixon line as a, as a boundary between North and South. The, the Ohio River is a much longer and I think more important boundary between North and South. I mean, Mason-Dixon, sure, it's important, but the Ohio River is incredibly important as, as this sort of moving, a vivid symbol of North and South, and he knew it well, and he, he was a, literally a ferry operator across the Ohio as a, as a teenager. So he, no one knew that language better than he did. I think we have a question, Bjorn. Yeah, hello. Uh, we have, a, actually, we have a number of questions. The people, the people on Facebook really want, are excited about this book, and they have some questions oh, for so nice. Ted. So I'm gonna pitch a couple of them at you. Uh, but then I'll let Ted answer, and then we'll get back to Daniel's uh, questions. Uh, first, I want to talk, uh, address a couple of things from David Wiegers. Now, David is an expert in Lincoln statuary, in Lincoln and bronze, and an author. And so first, David has told us, uh, just as a comment, that there is now a bust of Lincoln in Troy, Kansas, to commemorate Lincoln's speech there. It was dedicated in 2000. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Okay, yeah. that's great. And then David has a question for you, Ted, in addition to that. He would like to know, how was it decided at which cities Lincoln would stop? It seems like the train stopped and he gave short speeches at pretty, pretty obscure places. Did it have to do with where the train had to stop for water, for wood, these kinds of things? Well, those are such good questions. And, and we may need experts on Lincoln statuary soon because of the complicated historical revolution that's happening every every day as we speak. And um, 
there's a Lincoln statue in Boston that is, is um, now being discussed. And, and I'm, I'm sorry to say that because- The ball, Thomas Ball. Right, right. Um, and maybe, maybe we can come, come back to that later. But um, I didn't know about the statue in Troy. That's great to know. And I'm dying to get out to Troy. And I, if it gets safer, I want to just relive as much of the journey as I can by, by car. It's a little easier by car than, than by train. But um, so how did they plan the route? Well, they, they understood intuitively they couldn't go through Virginia, even though it would have been shorter. Virginia is teetering, it's still in the Union, and I, I later felt after all this research that it was a crucial victory for Lincoln that Virginia was in the Union at the moment of his inaugural, and we, we all know that it goes out of the Union, but it's in the Union on March 4th, 1861, which meant he became the president of something that was more like the United States than it might have been if Virginia had gone out. So he didn't want to force it, and he, he knew he had to steer a wide berth around Virginia, and, and he did. Um, so that left a complicated northern route, and it, we, we don't have a record of their thought processes, but it appears very likely that they wanted to pick up political support by going to state capitals and talking to governors and legislatures. So Daniel was mentioning he had a small number of speeches written out, He's a well-organized and very careful thinker, and he writes out most of his speeches to legislatures in state capitals. So that's Indiana, Ohio, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. And then, as Daniel mentioned, he has, he has to give hundreds of other speeches, so he can't really um, control the message in those places. And why did he pick this, the, the actual sequence of, of stops? Some of it had to do with the train lines themselves and the easiest way of, of getting from one place to another. I think he was co consulting with the, the man who directed the train trip. And Daniel has an amazing um, Yeah, let's, let's get into that okay. uh, a little bit because that will go flow into what you're doing. And here is an original pass signed by um, uh, Wood, the uh, William Wood, who was uh, found was found by Seward, appointed by Seward, to make the train trip, be over it, be an autocrat perhaps over it. Um, on the back, by the way, they even had uh, something to stop from forgeries. Yeah, I've never seen that. But uh, so here is Wood. Now you know he was suggested, as I said, by William Seward to do the superintendent and the arrangements. Now, Harold Holzer, I know, wrote of him that Wood made as many enemies as timetables. Hmm. So he was making the timetable on the route. So speak to that, please. So, right, I think Wood is still kind of a shadowy figure. I'd like to know more about him. He comes um, not only from Seward, but also from Seward's patron, the boss of upstate New York, Thurlow Weed. And even though I think we, most of us like Seward, I, I do, he was, another reason he had trouble getting the nomination is he was very close to this slightly corrupt state boss of New York, Thurlow Weed. And out of that friendship comes William Wood, the guy who makes the trains run on time, to quote, quote a well-known phrase. Um, and Wood later, not long after they all get to Washington, Wood gets in a lot of hot water. He befriends Mary Todd Lincoln, and he starts giving her very expensive gifts in the spring of 1861. I, I believe he gave her a pair of horses, which was a very extravagant gift, and seemed to be trying to parlay his friendship with her into political advantage. And uh, despite running the train trip, he was quickly um, ostracized from the early Lincoln White House and never close to them again. So it felt to me, without knowing all the details, that Lincoln had a kind of very dangerous presence right next to him. As he's going from city to city, the guy planning his train is possibly an enemy. And, and, and in the well, final Pinkerton, case, Pinkerton thought there's a possibility. Right. And so when they, a, a telling sign is, when they start getting overwhelming evidence that they're going to try to kill him in Baltimore, and Lincoln goes in the middle of the night with just Pinkerton and Ward Lamon, 
and a, a female agent named Kate Warney, they don't even tell William Wood. William Wood is the guy running the train trip. And they don't even tell him because they're afraid he's going to leak it to the killer. So that's, that gives you an idea of how high the tension was on this train. Well, you know, they, you, you were saying, let's get into that. And I, I was going to get into it a little bit later, but we're here right now. Uh, the assassination plots. And Pinkerton, Ward Lamon, uh, Seward sent his son. Um, Norman Judd was on that train, a close friend of, of Lincoln's. I had yep. a his invitation written out by Lincoln just last year to join him on the train. His son was in right. New Orleans and told his, his father he had heard things and Judd was saying that on the train as well. So, uh, and Kate Warney, many people reading this book will not have heard of her before. And she's an instrumental person in this. Now, you were talking about Wood not being, uh, n not knowing what was happening, there's a footnote of yours where you allude to uh, Cuthbert's book, Lincoln and the Baltimore Plot, about the various rivalries between the Lincoln protectors. Can you give us a brief glimpse in those rivalries on the train and as he was going east? This is so satisfying because these are such granular questions. I, I'm so happy to talk at this level. Um, Norma Cuthbert's book is wonderful and it, it's nice that you have Alan Pinkerton's book too and you know I'm not sure I'd seen the title page before you just held it up but it has beautiful typography on the, yes. on the title page. Yes. Um, but Norma Cuthbert worked at the Huntington Library in Pasadena and had access to a lot of really important documents there. Pinkerton later is famous for founding um, the predecessor to the U.S. Secret Service. And in the 1850s, he's a, uh, a railroad detective working out of Chicago, and he, he and Lincoln know each other. And when Dorothea Dix, whom I mentioned earlier, she's the mental health reformer, picks up the tip in the South that they're going to try to kill him, she goes to a railroad president in Philadelphia, who's a very interesting guy also, named Samuel Felton. Felton hires Pinkerton. So it's all through the, the railroads. And I, I kind of skipped the answer I owed you earlier. What, why he, is he a leveler? And it's because he, he loved what railroads could do. Transportation is very difficult in his childhood. Railroads make it easy. And he loves both the actual experience of being on a train, but what it symbolizes is if you're poor, you can get on a train and move to the next town and start your life. It, it symbolizes social mobility as well as geographical mobility. So um, through the railroad networks, Pinkerton is located and he comes out to Philadelphia first and then to Baltimore to infiltrate this crowd of killers. And he brings a very talented female spy with him. So two women are absolutely instrumental in saving Lincoln's life. And I, I felt so good about elevating women in this story because, I mean, it makes sense that they would be involved, but the way history is written, they're often left out. But uh, the woman who discovers the plot is Dorothea Dix, and then the, the bravest of the secret agents is Kate Warney, a young widow from Illinois, who imitates an Alabama uh, woman and becomes friends with all the pro-Southern plotters in Baltimore. And, Within a couple of weeks, they know all the details and they tell the, the people, they tell Norman Judd, whom, whom you mentioned, who's traveling with Lincoln. Judd is an extremely important person on, on this trip. And uh, they get the word to him and it gets a little more worrisome every day. And finally, um, on the second to last day, they all meet in Philadelphia and they decide that this is such a bad situation. We've got to take extraordinary measures. And that's when they decide to run him through in the middle of the night on an ordinary passenger train from Philadelphia through Baltimore to, to Washington. So uh, there were various plots. Just your, your impression, how there were so many plots that they heard about and you talk about in your book, in, at least in passing, even some of the small ones, derailing a train, et cetera. Uh, how many of these do you think were real and accurate? The reports I, that came in. And I forgot to address the rivalries among the protectors of Lincoln, too, which is... Yeah, briefly, what were they? 
Well, there are people traveling with him who don't think he should go go uh, incognito on an ordinary passenger train in the middle. Of the, I think it's very dangerous, which it certainly was. They thought it would be bad for him politically. But then as it turned out, there were two different groups of detectives looking into the assassination plot. So one is coming through the railroad, through Samuel Felton, who hires Alan Pinkerton, who brings out his very talented team and writes in great detail about how they foiled the plot in, in several different books that he published. And there are also some unpublished manuscript notes. But then um, separately, Winfield Scott, who's the commander in chief of the US Army, who's a fascinating figure because he's a Virginian. He's a Southerner, but he's loyal to the Union and to Lincoln. So one thing I tried to do in this book is show that it's a complicated thing to be a Southerner. It's a complicated thing to be a Northerner, that everything is kind of uh, gelling and hasn't quite settled yet. And there are very patriotic Southerners who, who saved Lincoln's life at this moment. And Winfield Scott was, is- Was Alexander Haig acting like, uh, yeah. Was he acting, Scott, yeah. acting like right. Alexander Haig with Nixon? Was he trying to take over? Because that interregnum was dangerous. It sure was. And even Seward is writing some funky memos, although Seward is also helping Lincoln enormously and co-writes the first, I mean, co-writes the beautiful final paragraph of the first inaugural. But um, anyway, Winfield Scott has asked a New York policeman named John Kennedy to also look into the plot. And he too finds strong evidence that there is a very large plot in Baltimore. So they get the son of William Seward, Frederick Seward, just to go uh, the second to last night of the trip to warn Lincoln. And because Lincoln gets these two warnings from two different sources, you know, he's always so mathematical and balanced in his brain. And with just one warning, he might not have changed his course. But when he gets the second, he's like, that proves it. That, that, that's a new warning from a different source that proves that it must be true. And that's when he decides he will go incognito. Uh, Bjorn, I think you have a question for us. Yes. Uh, well, we, actually, we have a lot of questions and comments. And so, but I'm just going to give you one. Uh, but I'm going to give you one comment and then a question that I want Ted to answer. The comment is that a lot of our viewers, or the observations, a lot of our viewers are very interested in that Thomas Ball statue and Washington, D.C. and what might be happening in the near future. So maybe if you decide to talk about that later, I think they'd be interested in hearing your perspective. Sure. But I also yeah. want to share a question. When we get to the end, we're going to talk yeah, about it. Yeah, do that at the end. All right. Okay. But I have a question from uh, Robert Black in Dayton, Ohio, right now. And Robert says he looks forward to reading the book. And he wants to know which stop and which speech surprised you the most, Ted? Oh boy, that's a good question. Um, the first night of the trip in Indianapolis, he has gone from Springfield to Indianapolis. And it's been a, you know, a difficult day with his very um, emotional farewell to Springfield. And then he gives a, a kind of hilarious but politically dangerous speech in which he uses a kind of coarse analogy and, and you know, we all know how, how upright a person Lincoln was, but he starts talking and the crowd starts laughing about his theory that he says the Southern theory of the union is like a free love definition of a marriage, meaning you can get the benefits of it whenever you want, but you don't have to assume any of the responsibilities for the more serious relationship. And it's, you know, he's basically talking about sexuality, which no president ever had talked about and no one ever did afterwards for, you know, probably until the Monica Lewinsky crisis. Um, so, and he was really criticized the next day, even though it was a, a successful, funny moment, like a stand-up comedian in the night in Indianapolis, because every word was being noticed and then telegraphed around the country by a media that was quite sophisticated. Um, so, so the train is moving fast and the words are moving even faster. This isn't the frontier any, anymore. That speech surprised me. And you know, probably the one I love the most is, the, I, I mentioned earlier, the one in Independence Hall where I thought he dug down very deep and 
and expressed the the purity of his love of the of the Declaration of Independence in a language that was so inclusive of everyone, including Af African Americans, and that I think that speech took him more than halfway toward the Gettysburg Address. So, the the one the first one in Indianapolis was sort of kind of surprising, for its humorousness, but also its recklessness, and then the Philadelphia Independence Hall for for its great beauty. Ted, um, you described talking about how things got known, uh, his, his journey was known throughout the country, much because of the telegraph, newly invented, and you call it lightning many times, and also too fast for the truth, uh, like tweets right. today, perhaps, right? Right. So how does the telegraph enter your story, and uh, were there incidents in which rumors traveled faster than the truth? And to what result, perhaps? It's a lot, but brief. Yeah, well, absolutely. And I, I felt that it was very important to convey some of the modernity of, I mean, in some ways, it's a very long time ago. And yet, America's changing really fast. And, and communications are, are moving. And, and transportation is, is moving. And I, I devote a chapter, chapter three, to how much the railroad and the telegraph had, had changed the country in the 10 years before Lincoln is elected and how specifically, I mean, it's nice to talk to people in Chicago because no city benefited more from the railroad than Chicago. It was this enormous hub of Western business that over year by year got steadily better and better connected to New York City, especially, but to all the cities of, of the East. And it's a little hard to imagine someone like Lincoln could have been elected from Illinois if the groundwork had not been laid by these fast connections of both trains moving people and him, for example, into the Cooper Union address and back, but also just the, his words are bouncing around the nation at a high rate of speed and it's helping all of these far-flung Republicans to understand each other a little bit better and be more of a party than they probably actually were. Um, and I, one, a key point I make in my chapter three is that it was a revolution that really had hit half the country and not the other half. So if you can imagine the U.S. now with high-speed internet in blue states only and then people still dialing in on modems in the red states, that's a little bit what it felt like, that the trains were not as fast or as frequent in the South, the telegraph um, not as good. Um, there were fewer repair facilities for trains, the tracks were, were built worse, the locomotive, there was no serious, or hardly any, a little bit, but not, not nearly the extent of the capacity to build locomotives in, in Southern cities. And, so there's a whole information economy that's extremely powerful that will never stop in the North. And it, I try to trace a line from what railroads symbolize, which is precision parts and New York connecting to Philadelphia, connecting to Pittsburgh, to connecting to Cleveland, you know, they all connected to each other and education became important. Science education becomes important to that. Um, the hiring of skilled workers, which leads to immigration to those cities. And there's negligible immigration into the South. So it's almost like two countries exist alongside each other that are very different, even before the election of 1860 and secession. So, um, you know, it, it's, it, it's in, but nonetheless, you do quote uh, the, that the Southerners started to see northern newspapers as the foreign press, quote unquote. That's right. So the Telegraph maybe was getting out to the north, but the south was listening to, and maybe the Telegraph got enough down there that they knew who Lincoln was, it. if they didn't yeah. know before. They could get it. I mean, a city like New Orleans was connected to, to uh, up the Mississippi and, and um, Charleston and Richmond were connected to, to, by telegraph to the north, but long stretches of the rural south were much, much less connected. Yeah. But they just were going, even when they could, under, could get each other's messages, they were going in different directions. And 
I try also to say, although this is not exactly a book about slavery, it's a book about Lincoln, but that the South was uh, aggressively seeking to expand slavery, that, that Lincoln was merely trying to keep a lid on Western expansion. Western expansion of slavery is exactly what the South wanted, and not only into the West of the United States, but into the Caribbean and into Northern Mexico. And so Lincoln talked about that in the 1850s, that there was a very reckless, dangerous foreign policy that was seeking to grab sections of Mexico and other, other Central American countries explicitly to introduce slavery into those sections, not only for financial gain, but to create new states in the US government for more senators in, in Congress. We had one of your students in here, Three Cornered War, Megan Kate Nelson. Oh yeah. Speaking. She Wonderful. was the last one to be here. So it's ironic that you're the oh, first one in our new that's, situation. That's great. She's a wonderful um, historian. So something I wanted to ask you just again, go into some of the weeds here, that Nicolay told of Lincoln's obsession, your talk about that, with handshaking. Some of you youngsters may have to Google what handshaking was, <laughs> but uh, that's changed. And Nicolay called it electrical communion. So did the people mob Lincoln because it's Lincoln? or because it was the first time they were ever close to a president or elect, president-elect? I think it was a, a bit of both. Um, I mean, there is something really important in the physicality of Abraham Lincoln. And we, you know, we instantly recognize him when we see a photograph or a statue. He, he didn't look like anyone before him and no one since has looked like him either. And it's not just his height or his skinniness, it's, there's something about the face, the sadness that we talked about earlier is, is visible in the, in the face. And people were drawn into him physically. They wanted to get near him. And wherever he went, huge crowds would try to touch him and, and shake his hand. But also, I think they understood that wherever he had come from, he had become the man of the moment and that America was changing forever as a result of his election, there had never been, I mean, there had only been two Northern presidents who were really Northern presidents. And that was John Adams and John Quincy Adams. Others were allied with the Democratic Party and the Southern political establishment. And so when Lincoln is elected, it's a kind of political revolution. And, and Northerners have been frustrated for a long time. The South has a stranglehold on everything, on legislation, on who gets the ambassadorships, on who gets the cabinet positions. And everybody knew it's going to be different now. So they all, without knowing what the future held or if there would be a war, they knew this man was the agent of a huge change coming. Plus he was so interesting to look at. So he yeah, was- that, that he certainly. Was, I found the word celebrity used a little bit before this trip, and I feel like he, he was the first big time political celebrity. Um, so one of the things you talk about in there also is you know, the numbers of people that he, he met. And there's so many anecdotes and stories. I can't, we're not gonna have any time to even get into the tip of the iceberg there, but they're wonderful. And as I've been saying uh, before leading up to this, uh, Zoom interview with you, that word of mouth is really going out with this particular book. Oh, Ted. thank it's, you. People are really taken to it. They love it. It's not only for us who are in the weeds that don't always hear everything that you come up with as far as anecdotes and et cetera, but also that it's great for a general reader to get into history and Lincoln's story is in, uh, in particular through a book that will they'll just zip through right. by reading. Right. Better than I think getting it on, on a disc and listening to it in the car. Yeah. Read it, it'll just take you there, as I said. Now, one of the, one of the people he met, one of them he, that we didn't mention, Ashley, was uh, Bascom, who really made the debates happen, uh, you know, from, got Follett Foster in, and he went up to the train. I had his copy of the Lincoln-Douglas debates inscribed by Lincoln to him. You're kidding. In Columbus. Wow. On the train. He came up with it, Bascom did, in a later edition, and 
Lincoln signed it to him because he knew what Bascom was to this. But uh, Bascom, uh, but the debates was all actually bound somewhere else after the beginning with Follett Foster because um, they wanted to come up with Warren Dean Howell's biography right here. There it is. There yeah. you got it. And that he was there. And you talk about William Dean Howell. He was the Dean of American Letters. Right. And uh, this had to be bound and put together by Follett very quickly. They had to get it out because there were so many others. In fact, Lincoln uh, called, as you mentioned here, uh, he called all these biographies an attempt on his life. Yeah. So another attempt. So, but you call William Dean Howell, I believe it was Howell, uh, a brachiopod. In what way was he a fossil? Well, that's because I, I, you know, I fell in love with my research over and over again, and that can be a, a flaw. And I had to, I had to make sure I didn't run on too long. And fortunately, I had a wonderful editor who, who died just before the book came out, I'm sorry to say, but uh, Alice, Alice Mason, was terrific. She was the best. And yes, she, she edited was. a lot of great Lincoln books. And she kept telling me, don't fall in love with your research. You know, you, you got to move, move the reader along. And thank God she said that. But I did, you know, city by city, I fell in love with what makes Cincinnati, Cincinnati, or what makes Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh. There's an amazing petroleum revolution, oil happening around Pittsburgh just at that time. And Columbus, I didn't, I didn't have the highest hopes for falling in love with Columbus, Ohio. And then I did. I totally did. Also, oh, beautiful city. It is. And that gorgeous state house, it's still there. Yeah, um, great river and has some good yeah. bookmen in there too over the is years. Is that right? Yeah. You know, everything you're holding up, I cannot wait to get out to the, the store, Daniel. So um, really tempted. Um, but, let, so, let's, let's go to your ending because okay. I'm going to talk about that and then we're going to talk about today. So we're okay. going to go over a little bit if you're okay with that. Sure. Um, oh, yeah, fine. So your ending made me think of the Spielberg movie because in the Spielberg movie, uh, here we are with the, with the 13th Amendment and the glorious thing that became. And then all of a sudden Spielberg took him and went with him to Ford's Theater and his death. And it seemed it, that one, at least in the movie, seemed added on uh, and just didn't seem right to many of us who read the book, uh, who saw the movie, which we loved up till that moment. Now, it's different in your book, I think, but that's why I want to talk to you about it, because you also go to his death. You're leaving Lincoln on the verge with all that hope and excitement and expectations, which we get to, and we're thinking, gosh, great. We know what the next four years are. I'll read the, his next book that takes him through those next years. And, but you took him to his death. And uh, so I want to ask you about why did you not leave, leave us on the verge? What did that epilogue mean to you? Well, it's such a smart question. I was really tempted. I thought all of them are. Yeah. I love the idea of ending it, and I do end it before the final chapter, but I love the idea of ending it as he's beginning to give his first inaugural address, because that's where most books begin. And I thought it was pretty interesting to end it there. And my point of the book is he has survived an extraordinary obstacle to a set of obstacles to even make it to that platform to become the president. So that was a good spot to end it. But there were a couple things. One is I felt that the funeral train back that we all know is so remarkably parallel to the train trip in that I didn't want to avoid the funeral train. I didn't want to linger on it for too long because that I mean that's a long story in itself and has been told but I thought it's just uncanny that he takes almost the same route he skips Pittsburgh he adds Chicago but the the eeriness of following the same route back and he's still on the train but he's in his coffin and the outpouring of grief the incredible outpouring of grief I thought was worth describing in a final epilogue I also found this story that I, I read about and I thought it was so interesting. I just wanted to add it and it felt like 
I mean, most of this book is a train trip, but then in the final weeks of his life, Lincoln starts going on boat trips and he gets on the River Queen, the same steamboat that he's gone to for the Hampton Roads Conference. And he goes to City Point in Virginia as Richmond is about to fall. And he's very, he gets probably much too close to the action in a dangerous way. And I found this amazing story I'm sure you, you and your your patrons know about it, but I, I did not, of him getting on smaller and smaller boats. And it's almost like he's going back to his childhood, like on a flat boat, mm. and finally getting off uh, just outside of Richmond in a war zone where there are like dead horses and dead men floating in the water. And he gets to the shore and a group of African-Americans maybe are free or maybe not. Nobody knows because it's like chaos. And they come over and they they begin to understand who is standing among them. And Lincoln gives a beautiful speech about freedom, which is not in the collected works of Roy Basler. But um, I, I thought it was legitimate sounding enough that I wanted to include it. And I thought that moment was so powerful that in a way that felt like the end of the journey because that is where slavery is finally falling apart. I mean, we know it goes on in some places a little longer and the whole reason for the Juneteenth holiday is that's when the word was given in Texas that emancipation had finally reached them in, in, on June 19th, 1865. So that's a little later, but it felt like when Lincoln is standing there in the banks of the James River with these African-Americans, it's the end of something. And I thought that was a powerful moment. And then I, after the bit about bringing his body home to Springfield, I just wanted to take a few pages, not too many, to reflect on what he has meant to all of us since then. So it was a kind of- yeah, That was um, powerful. Well, thank you. And, and you know, one thing I can say, I feel like I'm speaking among friends, is that this was a very emotional experience writing this book. And most of my books up till now, being academic, were like factual. They were almost like a scientist discovering some facts in a lab and then putting them out there. And this is like a story of a, of a great man and what he still means and his, his moral qualities. He's not just a great political actor on the grand stage of American politics. He's a great moralist. And that's the Lincoln I, I love who helped us get through a dark time in our history and emerge a much better and more inclusive country. Um, and so it was always emotional for me. And that's, I think, why I felt I needed to bring it to closure, but not just closure with death, closure with the, the eternal life of what this, this man still means to us. And I think he will be re relevant for as long as there is a United States of, of America. I hope so. Uh, and thank you for that, uh, bringing us into that epilogue. I wanted to hear what you had to say about that. Now let's come to today, because I... There are parallels positively, and uh, in any book of the Civil War, there are parallels today, but I found a couple in this one especially, uh, especially when you were talking about how the, uh, the people were waking up to the horrors of slavery. White America, who did not consider themselves abolitionists, were waking up to what slavery right. was and had done to maybe not only the country, but even to themselves. And today, White America, certainly, who did not, many of them who did not consider themselves crusaders are now marching for reform because of the George Floyd event. Uh, so there are events that spark this and change comes in the populace. So those parallels really struck me, shows how important the Civil War still is yep. and the study of it still is. And for the same time, uh, that the peril of the populace wanting to see then at Independence Hall, you showed that, and today, freedom, and bring what well, the core of America is, freedom, back to the forefront. Right. Another good parallel that you brought out in this right. book. It does feel just strangely parallel. It's, it, I, I started this in 2011, so I had no idea what would be like now I thought I'd finish it in two years, and like I said, it took took me nine. But um, yeah, it's not just that we have a a new 
empathy for African Americans and the extra pressures they they face in this country. It's mm. that we understand better than we used to that all of democracy depends on giving everyone a fair chance. That's what democracy is. And I talk about the importance of the word all and all men are created equal in the Declaration of Independence and how much Lincoln believed in that, that word all. And that word implies women as well as, as, as men. Um, so we are, are seeing something remarkably similar and it's, it's not just that we want the races to be treated equally. We, we are starting to see a connection between various forms of political corruption and the failure to have a level playing field. So one thing that was a very powerful political force in 1860 was every two weeks, it felt like there was some new revelation of financial corruption or political treachery coming out of James Buchanan's White House. And I, I just wrote a, an op-ed in the Washington Post about why exactly James Buchanan was so bad. And he, he had a terrible cabinet. They were embezzling a lot of money. They were sending arms from northern, uh, northern um, armories down to southern cities. And it just was like, just so corrupt. And I think that's happening now too, that even if you didn't know that you cared about Black Lives Matter, you're just tired of a, an America where there seems to be so much corruption around um, a certain group of people in power. And I, I, I wanna try to maintain bipartisanship. And I have many Republican friends, but it seems like this particular White House has a lot of problems all at the same time. And, and that's how it felt with James Buchanan. It just felt like we'd gotten very far away from the pristine message of democracy and self-government and human rights that was so clear in the second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence. And people wanted their country back. And that's that's what it feels like now. Yeah, but certainly it, it got to me that how the population was changing towards slavery and how the population today is slavery is changing toward empathy and tolerance and understanding right. of others in our communities, in our culture, and how we need Lincoln the leveler right now. Right. A number sure of people wanted to talk about the ball statue and let's not get into the whole thing. Let's just talk quickly about that one. It's a beautiful artistic statue. And, um, you know, we, we may, we may have to find boundaries instead of putting everything into a trash heap, but I can see in a way how that might upset some. But then again, in a way, it comes right out of what the African-American population felt about Lincoln after his death. And That's they right. may have, you know, we, we do feel today more and more that the, the slaves helped free themselves. They had help, but they also helped with their feet and came up yes. and freed themselves and then became soldiers, et cetera, to help crush the rest of it and bring their brothers or sisters back up. Uh, but at the same time, they also truly felt that Lincoln had been a catalyst in their lives to do that. And Ball kind of shows that maybe in a patronizing way, the way we look at it today, but that's also part of what that history was. These questions are so hard. You, you said all that beautifully. I agreed with every word. Um, you almost can't talk about it without getting someone mad either on the left or, or the right. Um, being a historian, I'm in favor of slowing down the conversation, bringing in different groups of people to talk in a measured way. That will probably get people angry who are just so happy to be tearing down statues that have bothered them for a long time. And I, I get where that anger has come from. I, I feel a pretty low level of regret when a Jefferson Davis statue gets torn down. And we, I mean, he's not a very likable person on a good day. And we know that a lot of those statues were put up in the teens and twenties as a kind of neo-Confederate movement. So it wasn't even, actual Confederates, it was sort of children and grandchildren. Um, and I'm 
pretty okay with with that, but I I was surprised when Ulysses Grant came down the other day and um, Columbus is suddenly in a question, I mean, is implausibly in the middle of a Civil War conversation. And now Lincoln is implausibly in a Civil War conversation. And I've thought a lot about the Thomas Ball statues. There's the, there are two of them. There's the big one in Washington in Lincoln Park where I used to live near and walk by every day. And it's a, it's a beautiful park and it's a beautiful statue. It's right in the center, it's, it's you know, iconic. The Boston version is, I think, smaller scale. Um, it's also, it's, a, it's not a great statue. I'm, I've spent a lot of my life in Boston, so I can talk pretty, no it's not in a great place. It's not in a place that you, most people even know where it is. It's not like it's in a big public, it's, it's near Boston Common, but not quite in it. It's kind of off a side street near some hotels. Um, so that one uh, is, is probably more vulnerable than the one in Washington. And I would say, I mean, I'm just talking off the top of my head, if that one were to come down or go into a museum, there are a lot of museums in Boston, I don't think it would be a tragedy. Um, there, there is another Lincoln statue I like much more in Boston. It's on Cambridge Common. It's the main park of Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's right in the center and it's great. And there's also, you know, there, there are a lot of famous Civil War statues. There's um, St. Gaudens' famous uh, relief on Boston Common. And I, I think I'm sure someone will disagree, but if the Lincoln statue in an awkward place were to come down in Boston, I don't think it's a tragedy. The one in Washington is a little harder. It's, I think, the first Lincoln Memorial way before the actual Lincoln Memorial was built. It's a you know, very historic statue. You're right that African Americans helped raise the money for it, although I'm happy to say I read about it recently. I think I just read it on Wikipedia, but Frederick Douglass even at the time of its unveiling, expressed some skepticism. Yes. And, and I get that. I mean, it, it, it is a humbling uh, description of an African-American way down below a towering Lincoln. I don't think you can rebuild a statue, but um, maybe there are ways we can artfully put it into a better context by building some new statuary around it or... Um, maybe even re, I don't know, recontextualizing what's there with some museums have, have like the Museum of Natural History, which has had its problems with Theodore Roosevelt. They've done some really interesting work in their interior galleries where they, they, they left everything, but they put up new plaques explaining why the text of a label from 50 years ago might appear racist now. And so there could be new signage saying, this was paid for by African-Americans not everyone liked it. Frederick Douglass didn't like it. Um, in 2020, it's very uncomfortable, but it's a historic part of the Capitol Hill neighborhood, and um, we think it belongs here to this day. And I, I would be in favor of keeping it, but having better signage. Um, but this is a very fast-moving conversation. Yeah, it is. I, I'm, well, thank you for giving us your thoughts on sure, this. Yeah. And I'm sure many others are going to be having thoughts on our Facebook page and elsewhere. Uh, I'm going to chime in with over. just one, if I can. I'm going to yeah. chime in with just one of the comments. And it's from David, our, our expert on Lincoln statuary. And what David says is a lot like what you just said, Ted. But I also wanted to point out uh, something that might be, uh, that might add some uh, context to our conversation. Uh, David did point out that while African Americans raised the money for the statue, uh, they were never consulted on the design. Good point. And there was never any sort of committee or anything like that. And indeed, right. it was controversial as soon as it was dedicated. Good, very good points. And I'll just bow out, but I wanted to let, make sure that David got his word in on well, that. Well, we're going to go back to you, Bjorn. Thank you for that. I think that was well put, and we should all remember that as well. Uh, I just want to show you something here because we've been showing you this. I happen to have gotten this just the other day, yesterday to be exact, and it's a photograph of the German photograph of Lincoln. This is what he looked like when he was on that train and uh, beard growing a little bit more every day. This particular one, uh, this came from the original 
glass plate that uh, Herbert Wells Fay, the custodian of the Lincoln tomb, had. And in fact, uh, he writes on this, giving it to someone. And then Isaac Diller, Tad Lincoln's friend, who was in the Whipple photograph at the Lincoln home in the summer of 1860, in right. front, blurred, uh, he writes on this as well, which is kind of nice. But it's interesting because I wanted to show you this. This is what he looked like. But this is also what the glass plate looked like. Because now what I can give you today, you know that we've done this, and I have one of these. Let me just get one of these photographs. And you know, we have these that if you want to uh, get a $75 photo, I think well, it's 125, I think. We don't have many of these left. But you can see what happened to the glass plate. Yep. And in between, I mean, me seeing it, in fact, uh, it was able to be put back together from these big cracks, but all this mottling occurred as well. But at least the face, was not uh, harmed. Yep. And so today we can get you one of these if you'd like to put this next to your, next to Ted's book. We have these as well. Ted, thank you so much for being here. Oh, Daniel. Being with us today. And Such a pleasure. And entering your book. It's really terrific. And so we'll see you again. And I'm going to turn this over to Bjorn, who's going to say goodbye for all of us. Yeah, if you want to give my email address to any, any of your customers, it's absolutely fine with me. So, um, okay, but thank I, you for that. It was such a pleasure. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ted. And again, for everybody at home, this has been A House Divided. It is uh, our live streamed book signing and book discussion program. We've been doing it since 2005. We often have been doing it in a two camera shoot studio with all the whistles and bells, but now because of the, uh, because of the pandemic and all, we're doing it with Zoom. We thank you so much for participating. We thank everybody that wanted to ask a question or didn't ask a question and we didn't get to it. We apologize that we didn't get to it, but perhaps, uh, perhaps we can answer the questions in Facebook later. And I don't know whether Ted would be interested in, in participating in that kind of thing. But I don't have, not on Facebook, but I'm happy to do it by email. Okay. You. Okay, great. And this is your book. This is the book. Again, link it on The Verge. You can order it at the link that we provide in the comments. And we thank you all for coming. So we're going to close out this edition of A House Divided. And we will see you next time.